Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. What does God say? He is our hope in distress. He is our light in darkness. Do not fear for God is with you. God is your strength. God is your help. God will lift you up. If God is for you, no one can be against you. Well, how are you today? Welcome online. We are doing a, we're in a series called Feel the Fear. We're talking about different fears and we all struggle with fear and being anxious, angst, whatever we want to call it, but we struggle with those things. And today we're going to be talking about the fear of finances. Uh, American Psychological Association found that money is the leading cause of stress. Business News Daily says that the main source of stress for most people is money, and then they list these four in the top 10 of all fears. They say always living paycheck to paycheck falling into serious debt, becoming homeless, losing my job. Those are ranked in the top 10 of, of all fears, financial or, or, or otherwise. But you know, the thing is, is financial fears affect everybody, not just people that are living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, people that have accumulated a lot of wealth have fears, all kinds of fears associated with that. U.S. News and World Report says the wealthiest Americans, they fear what Jerome Powell is going to do with the interest rates, the stock market, what that's gonna, what's going to happen with that, whether it's time to sell or buy real, their real estate. Their identity theft is a huge fear. Uh, friends that are, optimist, are opportunistic is a big thing. And then also the number one uh, Fear with people that are wealthy are lawsuits. They're afraid of, of being sued. And, and in fact, studies show that people that, have the, that are in the upper, uh, upper ranges of wealth have more fear than people in lower in, 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 in living paycheck to paycheck. For example, 48% of well-off boomers, the same report said, people, and they define that as, as boomers that have saved up a million dollars for retirement or more that they have incredible anxiety about whether they will have enough for retirement. But it's not just those. It's whether you have a million, 10 million, or even 25 million stocked away, that's the number one concern is, will I have enough? Because they, people that have more spend more. I mean, they, their, their lifestyle is higher. So it's the same equation, just bigger, bigger numbers. So what do you do? If you, if you can stockpile tens of millions and still be racked with fear. What do you do? How do you resolve that? Well, notice what Proverbs says there. Solomon, wealthiest man who ever lived, said this, give me enough food to live on, neither too much nor too little. If I am too full, I might get independent saying, God, who needs him? If I'm poor, I might steal and dishonor the name of my God. So when is it too much? What's too much? When you start to get independent of God, you think it's all up to you. You don't need God. And then all of a sudden, you're, you start having fears because you're doing it all on your own. That's too much. When wealth causes us to forget the source, God is the source. He's the reason. You say, well, Andy, I can work. I work real hard. That's how I made my money. Well, yeah, but God is the one who gives you the, re the ability to make money. He's the one who gave your, 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 your intellect and your, and your health. And all the things that you've used. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. When we get this in the right perspective, our fears go down. Now I want to just quickly address three common misconceptions about money in our culture. No, number one, and these, will, these cause fear. Number one is we think it will provide satisfaction. That ultimately I'll be happy if I have enough money. And if that's true, 
then the wealthiest people would be the happiest people. And we all know that that certainly is not the case. And we confuse our yearning power with our earning power because we always want more. Look at what Ecclesiastes says. It says, you will never be satisfied if you long to be rich. You will never get all that you want. In other words, it's foolishness to think that wealth brings happiness. Sylvester Stallone was once interviewed about all the money he had. He said, hey, does that, is life easier? Are you happier? And here's what he said. He said, money does not bring peace of mind. Actually, money brings more problems. Everything is magnified 100,000 times. That's not to complain, but once you make a fortune, you think it all becomes green lights and blue skies, but that's not true. And then he concludes and says this, as a matter of fact, it brings out some of the most vile characteristics of other people's personalities that you can imagine. So some people think, hey, it'll bring me that sense of satisfaction. Others say, well, it'll bring me significance. I'll finally uh, be recognized, be valued. I'll get the fame I'm looking for, the status. I can, my self-esteem will feel better because that's so weak. So I can buy all these little symbols that prop up my, my sagging self-esteem. And notice this verse, it says, The pride that comes from wealth and importance, these are not from God. They are from the world itself. And so we have a tendency to confuse our net worth with our self-worth. And that's, a, that's something our, our culture it just breeds in, even in our advertisers. Hey, if you have this, if you have this status symbol, you'll be valued. You'll be envied by your neighbors and other people. And if we buy into that, it just causes more problems. And then we think that it brings, that, it, that it'll bring security. That it brings security. And as I said, I mean, here's these people that have amassed millions and they're insecure. They're, they're, they're worried about their retirement. State lotteries, when people, uh, when they win those, did you know one third of them go from rags to riches to bankruptcy? And then another 25% end up selling the remainder of their payments at a discounted rate in order just to pay off debt. So that's a problem. There's always a catastrophe bigger than your pile of money. I have two relatives, close relatives that they don't know each other, they're on two, both sides of the family, but they have both become multimillionaires, and then within just a couple of years, they lost everything, just dirt broke, for totally unrelated things, they don't know each other. But that's how fast it can happen. I mean, these, there's plenty of people that, you're, you're just one catastrophe away from losing it all. So if you, put your, if you think that's going to get you security, you're going to live with fear the whole time knowing that that could be taken away that quick. Now Solomon, as I said, he was the wealthiest man who ever lived. He had so much, he, he, all of his dishes, his cups, everything he drank from solid gold. When he washed his dishes, he had to polish them too. Well, of course, he had other people do it for him, but that's a lot of money. And so he gives quite a bit of wisdom. He said, hey, I've had all of that wealth, and here's what wealth actually brings. More wealth brings more expenses. The more we have, the more we have to insure the more we have to, uh, the, the, to upkeep. I mean, you think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, but their water bill is higher too. <laughs> Notice uh, here in Ecclesiastes 5.11, it says, the more you have, the more you spend right up to the limits of your income. And so that certainly just becomes a vicious cycle. There's people that are so committed to the American dream, they'll go into debt in order to get it. And it just it keeps going round and round. Number two, more wealth brings more worries. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, A working man can get a good night's sleep. The rich, however, have so much that they stay awake worrying. And how, that's so true. I mean, they just worry, oh, no, how can I, you know, protect my money? How can I invest it? How can I insure what I need to? How do I invest it? How do I avoid taxes? And here he says, the working person, the blue collar person, they just, they go and work all day. They come home, they relax in front of the TV, pop open a Budweiser, make love to his wife. He sleeps like a baby. On the other hand, you know, the white collar worker, they're, they come home at night and they're thinking about, oh no, who do I need to fire? Who do I need to hire? Will that deal go through? Will the stocks go up and down? Will I make that commission? And just on and on. And they, they, they lose sleep. There's studies that show that as, increme, as income increases, insomnia increases. And then in another study by the National Opinion Research done by the University of Chicago, it says as income goes up, 
sex goes down. That's a bummer, right? That's not good. But I mean, it, it, can, it can affect our libido. Money worries. Money worries. Number three, more pain if it's lost, right? I mean, the more you have, the more it hurts if you lose it. The more to be fearful about losing it. Ecclesiastes 5 says, risky investments turn sour, and soon there's nothing left. It is swept away. The rest of our life is under a cloud. The rest of our life is under a cloud. Gloomy, discouraged, frustrated, and angry. Gives you these four types of pain. He says it's gloomy where you're just depressed or you're discouraged because of, you know, it lets you down. You're frustrated. How many people do you know that are just they're frustrated over their finances or they're just angry? People just get bitter. They lost it, and they hold on to that for years, maybe their whole life. So wealth can bring a lot of emotional problems and stress into our life. Certainly reason to cause us to fear. How do you break the back of fear? Uh, now, this is not just for money. This is just for, for anything that we fear. But certainly it applies to money. Three attitudes that break the grip of fear. Number one is be hopeful. Just having an ad, recognizing that God is for you, not against you. Deuteronomy 8.18, that verse we read earlier where it says, always remember it's the Lord who gives you the power to produce wealth. He's the one who has good things for you. He cares about you. Now, sometimes we don't, we don't, we're not like that, right? We're just kind of like the chicken little where we're waiting for the sky to fall in and then we blame it on God. You know, insurance, they say acts of God. It's always bad things, right? You never have a list of all these great things God does. Acts of God are these terrible things. And that's how some people have, the, that's, they're, they're wired that way. You gotta, be, you gotta rewire yourself if that's you. Be hopeful about God. There's an author, a guy named Ken Blanchard, wrote a book called The One Minute Manager. He was not a Christ follower when he wrote that book. It was an overnight bestseller. He all of a sudden he made millions. You know, I heard him speak a few years ago. He said, hey, when that happened, he goes, that just, he goes, that doesn't happen. He goes, I'm smart enough. No, that's unusual. I've never written a book before. I wrote one all of a sudden. It's an overnight success. He goes, I just sensed God was involved in that. So I looked into Christianity, gave my life to Christ, you know, recognizing, hey, if I'm an overnight millionaire, that must be God. Now, you know, that's not very common, right? It's usually everybody waits till they're at their worst place. Then they go, well, God must be saying something. You know, God sometimes says something through blessings. We just miss that. We miss it. And so being hopeful, Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, if God gives a man wealth and property and lets, and lets him enjoy them, he should be grateful and enjoy what he has worked for. It is a gift from God. Circle that word gift. God wants to give you good gifts. And when you realize that, it helps you to be hopeful for your future, that God has a future and a hope for you. Number two, be happy. It's good to enjoy the things God gives you. When my kids were small and I'd give them gifts, I wanted them to enjoy them, right? That's just part of a father heart or a mother heart. You just want your kids to enjoy the things. And that's what God wants for you. Ecclesiastes 7, 14 says, enjoy prosperity whenever you can. And when hard times strike, realize that God gives one as well as the other so that everyone will realize that nothing is certain in life. And that's true. Things aren't certain. You can lose things. Things come and go. And God says, hey, I'm sovereign. I'm over all of that. I can, I'll, I'll walk with you through difficult times. I want you, though, during times of prosperity to enjoy it. Happiness is not how much you have. It's being happy with whatever you have. You don't need more. You know, here's the thing. is the wealthiest person on, on, on the planet is the person who's happy with the least. If you're happy with less, and you're not always on that rat reel trying to get more, you're the happiest person. You don't have to always fall into that. Ecclesiastes 6, 9 says, It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to always wanting something else. There's freedom when you can be happy with, the, with where you're at, and you're not always trying to get something else in order to be happy. Number three is be humble. Be humble. There's, an, there's just kind of an attitude that recognizing God is your provider. He's the source of everything. And this day that you have right now <clears throat> is given to you by God. That's why the Bible says that we rejoice with each day that God gives us. 
Be glad in the day that God gives us. Now, notice here about humility and wealth. It says, 1 Tim- Timothy 6, 17. It says, command those who are rich. <clears throat> and you, you might be thinking, well, that's not me. What? But it is. All of us here, compared to the rest of the world, we're, we're rich. We're wealthy. I mean, you're in the top percentage. You know, if you own a house, you're in the top 3% in the world. If you own a car, you're in the top 6% in the world. And so it doesn't get any better than this. I mean, we can always have our eyes on somebody else, but we're, th- he's talking to us. And he says, command those who are rich, he says, in the things of this life, not to be, what, proud, but to place their hope, not in such uncertain things as riches, but in God, who generously gives us everything for our enjoyment. He wants us to enjoy it. He says, that's why I gave it to you. But listen, when you have a lot, we, the, what happens is pride can sneak in. And we start thinking, oh, I don't really need God. I can do this on my own. I, I made this money on my own. I didn't need God to get it in the first place. And all of these little things start chipping away at it. And, and being humble is, is always recognizing this is, you know, everything I have, my life, the ability to make wealth, everything, that all comes from God. So that's what I'm talking. That's, that, that breaks the back of humility. Humility. So humility is very important. We need humility in our lives. And what that means is putting God first place. Saying, God, you're first in my life. I don't have to look for anything else in order to get my needs met because you will provide for me. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Then we're going to continue with our baptism service. Well, Lord, I just thank you for your provision for us. And some of you, you you're in that place where you're, you're worried. You have fear. Maybe it's about finances. Maybe it's about something else. And this is the moment where you just say, God, I want to just release all of that. I want to be hopeful. I want to learn to be happy. I want to learn to be humble. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that certainly would be that step of humility. Saying, God, I want, to, I want to trust you. I want to follow you. Say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Right where you're at. Just in, say, God, I want, to follow, I want to be a follower of Christ. And then would you say, God, help me overcome my fears. Help me to be able to release that stuff so that I can live in each day in your sufficiency. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.